Again, good morning, and thank you so much for joining us for morning prayer here at Church for a Savior. We are better because you chose to spend your time among us in worship. Um, I, 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 I offer some announcements. Uh, we have, there's a separate video uh, on the website as well as on our YouTube channel around regathering and reopening. Uh, we've done a lot of work and we're asking for your help. Um, we, we do, um, we are on track to have live streamed worship on July 19th. That'll be hybrid with people in person and not in person. We are working to figure out what we can do as far as people in person, but we are working towards reopening and regathering. Please look at that, that video. Uh, on, on wonderful news, um, I'm standing here at the back of the church um, with a beautiful case that was made by John Balance. Many or most of you uh, probably heard about this. These cases uh, will hold vestments, historical vestments that we have here at the Church of Our Savior. And we are the oldest uh, Protestant church in the St. Gabriel Valley. And so I'm very happy and excited um, to be able to um, um, display our wonderful historical piece of art essentially, that we use in liturgy. So um, thank you to John Balance. Uh, it will surprise no one for me to say he's a gentleman and a scholar, and we are so, um, we are so much better as a community uh, for he and his family's presence with us. Good morning. 
And welcome to the Church of Our Savior on this fifth Sunday after Pentecost for morning prayer, both right one and right two. As we always say here at the Church of Our Savior, we are better because you chose to spend your time among us in worship. So thank you so much for joining us this morning. You can find a bulletin at cosepiscopal.org or at bcponline.org. Um, uh, but thank you so much for joining us. Again, this is the fifth Sunday after Pentecost. It's also, I, I just did the math, the 17th Sunday of COVID time. Um, w w everything is unprecedented for our worship at this time, so thank you so much. We are so much better because you joined us this day. Morning prayer, right one, will begin this morning on page two of your bulletin or on page 42 of the Book of Common Prayer. O Lord, open thou our lips, and our mouths shall show forth thy praise. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. O come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us heartily rejoice in the strength of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. And show ourselves glad in him with songs. For the Lord is a great God, and a great King above all gods. In his hands are all the corners of the earth, and the strength of the hills is his also. The sea is his, and he made it. And his hands prepared the dry land. O oh, come, let us worship and fall down. And kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is the Lord our God. And we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. O oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Let the whole earth stand in awe of him, for he cometh, for he cometh to judge the earth. and with righteousness to judge the world and the peoples with his truth. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. I invite you to be seated if you choose at home. I now invite you to join us in saying together Psalm 145, verses 8 through 15. Psalm 145, verses 8 through 15. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and of great kindness. The Lord is loving to everyone, and his compassion is over all his works. All your works praise you, O Lord, and your faithful servants bless you. They make known the glory of your kingdom and speak of your power, that the peoples may know of your power and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Your dominion endures throughout all ages. 
The Lord is faithful in all his words and merciful in all his deeds. The Lord upholds all those who fall. He lifts up those who are bowed down. Glory to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. A reading from the prophet Zechariah. Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter Jerusalem. Lo, your king comes to you, triumphant and victorious is he, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. He will cut off the chariot of Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem. And the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall command peace to the nations. His dominion shall be from sea to sea, and from the river to the ends of the earth. As for you also, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. Return to your stronghold, O prisoners of hope. Today I declare that I will restore to you double. Here endeth the lesson. Letter from Paul to the Romans. I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing that I hate. Now, if I do not, if I do what I do not want, I agree that the law is good, but in fact, it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells within me that is in my flesh. I can will what is right, but I cannot do it. For I do not do the good I want, 
but the evil I do not want is what I do. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do what is good, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inmost self, but I see in my members another law at work with the law of my mind, making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Here ends the lesson. I invite you to join us in saying together Canticle 18, which can be found on page 4 of your bulletin, or on page 93 of the Book of Common Prayer. Splendor and honor and kingly power are yours by right, O Lord, our God. For you created everything that is, and by your will they were created and have their being. And yours by right, O Lamb that was slain, for with your blood you have redeemed for God. From every family, language, people, and nation, a kingdom of priests to serve our God. And so to him who sits upon the throne and to Christ the Lamb, be worship and praise, dominion and splendor, forever and forevermore. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. A reading from the Gospel according to St. Matthew. Jesus said to the crowd, To what will I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to one another. We played the flute for you and you did not dance. We wailed and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking and they say he has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. At that time, Jesus said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent, and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father. And no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light." Here endeth the lesson. Neither anticipated that the cause of the conflict might cease, or even before the conflict itself should cease. Each looked for an easier triumph and a result less fundamental and astounding. Both read the same Bible and pray to the same God, and each evokes his aid against the other. It may seem strange that any men should dare to ask a just God's assistance in wringing their bread from the sweat of other men's faces, but let us judge not that we not be judged. The prayers of both could not be answered. That of neither has been answered fully. The Almighty has his own purposes. Woe unto the world because of offenses, for it must needs be that offenses come, but woe that man by whom the offense cometh. Many of you are aware that my former parish, Holy Trinity in Fayetteville, North Carolina, was immediately adjacent to the largest military installation in the world, uh, as, as far as people. 
um, hundreds of thousands of, of military personnel uh, transferred in and then out of Fort Bragg every year. Continues to happen. Uh, faithful, loving, wonderful people. Uh, people that are, are godparents to my children. Uh, people that I still hold near and dear to my heart. One of the experiences I had as, as an Episcopal priest um, after taking a call uh, to a military community uh, was conversations with, with colleagues uh, that were not acquainted with military communities. I have uh, friends, close friends, faithful uh, clergy and friends who, who asked me in moving to a military community uh, what it was like wrestling with my faith, ministering to people serving in the military. I, I, I have heard faithful, loving people say that they couldn't do that. They, they, they wouldn't be able to engage with, with military personnel because of their pacifism, because of their love of Jesus and their desire uh, for the Prince of Peace, for the Kingdom of God, when war is not necessary, uh, when all of us can live in peace and harmony. Uh, and, and when they would, would engage with me about this and say, how, how as a Christian, how as a follower of Jesus, can you minister to people who, who fight, people who, who, who are trained to, to kill. That's what the military does. How, how, can you, how can you engage with people who are doing that for a living? And I would always shift the conversation and I would say, well, well, we, well we often talk about privilege now in the Episcopal Church. These conversations began to happen right around the time when the Episcopal Church started having a lot of conversations about privilege. And a lot of those same colleagues that would talk about um, their uh, emotions, their inconsistencies around ministering to military personnel would often use the words uh, of our own privilege. And so I would say, well, well, I, I, for me, uh, for me as, as a person who has not served in the military, much less in active combat ever, in any way, shape, or form, I, I cannot understand the experience of our men and women uh, in the military. I cannot understand the sacrifices that they and their entire families make day in and day out, uh, out of necessity in the world. I can't understand that, and, and quite frankly, the fact that I can't understand that is privilege. The fact that I don't know what it's like to pack up all of my belongings and go overseas because someone higher up told me to, to tell my family or my spouse that I won't be there for a birthday or a wedding or a funeral because a higher up decided I needed to go. I don't have that experience and that is a form of privilege within myself. And I can tell you that ministering to and for and with people serving our military has been a blessing, a deep blessing, a transformative blessing in my life. And it has not, it has not led to me stopping from asking hard questions, hard questions from myself, hard questions of my country, hard questions of my leaders, quite, quite the opposite. If we shall suppose that American slavery is one of those offenses which, in the providence of God, must needs come, but which, having continued through his appointed time, he now wills to remove, and that he gives to both North and South this terrible war as the woe due to those by whom the offense came, shall we discern therein any departure from those divine attributes which the believers in the living God always ascribe to him? One of the many, many blessings that uh, my wife and I received uh, ministering in a military community was, was sharing and, and walking with and, and, and sitting in um, the complexity of issues with uh, active military personnel. Uh, what I mean by that is, of course, you know, I, I was the rector of, of a church in a military community um, over two very different administrations because I, I, I arrived to Holy Trinity uh, in, in 2012 and I, and, I la and I left in 2019. So you do the math and you can know that I, I was rector over two very different administrations. As, and as you can imagine, um, I heard very different experiences of those in administrations from our military personnel. And, and what I learned is just how complex 
their relationship is with the institution of our country. And yet they still, still day in and day out, wake up in the morning and put themselves in harm's way in order to protect us. Because if they didn't, invariably, in a complex world uh, with other countries that are also, also threats, uh, America would not be in existence. And so these men and women wake up day in and day out, whomever is president, whoever is in charge of them, and they do whatever they are told. And because of that, you and I, I am able to, to, to wake up tomorrow morning and eat breakfast with my daughters. I, I need to sit in that reality in order to be aware of the complexities uh, that we face around our military. And another blessing, I, 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 I don't always agree with my bishop. Can you, can you tell in the little screen if he's watching or she's watching? I, I don't know. I don't tell them, but I don't always agree with my bishops. And one of the blessings I've received from, my, from military men and women who I love is how to sit and be loyal to institutions when they are complex institutions when they disappoint you, institutions when they fail you, how to keep waking up the next day and sacrificing for an ideal, however imperfectly it manifests itself in your life. That's been a blessing I've received because of men and women in the military and their understanding, their experiences of the world. Fondly do we hope Fervently do we pray that this mighty scourge of war may speedily pass away. Yet, if God wills that it continue until all the wealth piled by the bondsman's 250 years of unrequited toil shall be sunk until every drop of blood drawn with the lash shall be drawn, paid up by another drawn with the sword, as was said 3,000 years ago, so it must be said, the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. March 4th, 1865. It had been a cold and rainy March that year uh, in Washington, D.C. It had rained so much that authors, historians say that wagon wheels in Washington, D.C. Were, were stuck. They could not be pushed through the mud. And so for his second inaugural address, President Lincoln had a very small crowd. They were huddled together. They were, they were cold. Lincoln rose to the east portico to, to give an address to a country deeply divided through, through violence, through war. The Civil War was, was over the hump, so to speak. Uh, it was clear that the North would be victorious. Uh, and everyone was debating what Reconstruction would, should look like. Lincoln rose and instead of declaring complete victory for the North, instead balanced the deep, unmistakable sin of slavery with the violence of the Civil War and inquired aloud that if the violence of the Civil War was God's providential effect, God's providential punishment for 250 years of slavery, would we, would any of us ask God if that was logical? Ask God if that was just. Neither party expected for the war the magnitude or the duration which it has already attained. Neither anticipated that the cause of the conflict might cease with or even before the conflict itself cease. Each looked for an easier triumph and a result less fundamental and astounding. Both read the same Bible and pray to the same God, and each invokes his aid against the other. It may seem strange that any men should dare to ask a just, just God's assistance in wringing their bread from the sweat of other men's faces, but let us judge not that we not be judged. The prayers of both could not be answered. That of neither has been answered fully. 
The Almighty has his own purposes. Woe unto the world because of us offenses, for it must needs be that offenses come, but woe to that man by whom the offense cometh. If we shall suppose that American slavery is one of those offenses which, in the providence of God, must needs come, but which, having continued through his appointed time, he now wills to remove, and that he gives to both north and south this terrible war as the woe due to those by whom the offense came, shall we discern therein any departure from the, those divine attributes which the believers in a living God always ascribe to him? Fondly do we hope, fervently do we pray that this mighty scourge of war may speedily pass away. Yet, if God wills that it continue until all the wealth piled by the bondsman's 250 years of unrequired toil shall be sunk, and until every drop of blood drawn with a lash shall be paid by another drawn with a sword, as was said 3,000 years ago, so it must be said, the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. I love this country. I am deeply grateful to the depths of my soul for the privileges and liberties I have never earned that are afforded to me as a citizen of this great country. I have been blessed deeply by active and retired men and women of our armed forces. On this July, July 4th weekend, my family will be remembering the liberties that we were given by the sacrifices of others. And, and, that does not mean, that does not mean we can not look honestly, starkly into the mirror, into ourselves, into our country, into our world, into the mistakes we individually and collectively have made. I, I just read uh, beautifully 19th century prose from uh, President Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln looms large in, in my family. Uh, in my family, there's a, not on the Thornburg side, but on the Pollock side. Pollock is my mother's maiden name. There is a myth that we are related to Abraham Lincoln. If you see Eleanor, my eldest daughter, on campus and ask her, she will tell you from the depths of her soul that she's related to Abraham Lincoln. I'm not so sure. Others are not so sure. The, the, the link is, is, is tenuous at best and most likely an illeg illegitimate one from someone, an other person within the family. I won't go into that. Well, the point is, I'm proud to be associated with someone who, who so deeply and beautifully wrote about God's providence and suffering. Theodicy is that um, area of study uh, in seminary, the, the study of what suffering means in relationship to God and humanity. To have a, a president write that so beautifully, I'm quite proud of that. And, and, I'm ashamed of actions that I know Abraham Lincoln committed as a president. I can give historical context, decisions other people were making at that time, but that does not alleviate my need to look honestly at that person and their behaviors, just like I need to look at myself honestly and my own behaviors, my own inclinations, my own proclivities, my own biases. This is a great and wonderful country because because we have liberties and because we heart ask hard questions, because we are willing to go deep and ask questions about those who have gone before and those who will come after, because we are willing to engage truth, this is a wonderful country. Because this, this church, Church of Our Savior, has history that is complex, we are a beautiful church. We should not run away from it, we should not hide it, we should not do away with it, but we must engage it honestly, faithfully, and with an open eye. To go back to uh, the gospel lesson uh, we read just a, a few moments ago from our gospel of Matthew, uh, I did get to the gospel, it just was at the end of my sermon. Uh, at, at, in our gospel lesson this morning, Jesus ends saying, come to me all you that are weary 
and are carrying heavy, burden, heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Come to me, all you that are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. I'm weary. I am carrying heavy burdens. Burdens uh, in my daily life, burdens because of who I am, burdens because of the history uh, handed to me by those who have gone before, burdens because I am living in 2020, and every day there's new news that is terrible. The good news, the great news, the transformative news is that we have, we have a shepherd. In our reading this morning, Jesus isn't asking us to be the shepherd. Jesus isn't saying that we have to have all the answers. Jesus is saying, come to me, go to Jesus. If you are carrying heavy burdens, if you feel heavy, and he will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am weary and lonely in heart. We are built, we are made to be yoked with one another, following Jesus. And if you think, if I think that we're meant to be yoked with people who agree with us and people who voted the same way with us, we have lost the point of the gospel. Our charge is to follow and to learn and to be with Jesus. The blessing, the grace, is that we have been redeemed. We are known and loved by God. As a byproduct of that knowledge and that love and that grace, we need to have the courage to not always be right to not always have the answers, to, to, to sit in complexity, hear truths, share truths, and be transformed in relationship. Come to me, Jesus says, if you're carrying heavy burdens, and I'll give you rest. May we be a people at Church of Our Savior, able to hold complex truths up and next to each other, and learn from one another in order to follow Jesus and spread light and love in the world. I now invite you to join us in reaffirming our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed, which can be found on page 53 of the Book of Common Prayer, or on page 4 of your bulletin. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
The Lord be with you, and also with you. Let us pray. Let me, can I start that over again? Sure. Because I should say... Okay. Ready? The Lord be with you and with thy spirit. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. O God, who has taught us to keep all thy commandments by loving thee and our neighbor, grant us the grace of thy Holy Spirit, that we may be devoted to thee with our whole heart and united to one another with pure affection. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. O God, who make us glad with the weekly remembrance of the glorious resurrection of thy Son, our Lord, grant us this day such blessing through our worship of thee that the days to come may be spent in thy favor through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I now invite you to join us in saying together the general thanksgiving, followed by the prayer of St. Chrysostom, which can be found on page 58 and 59 of the Book of Common Prayer, or on page 7 and 8 of the bulletin. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, thine unworthy servants, do give thee humble and hearty thanks for all thy goodness and loving kindness to us and to all men. We bless thee for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all, for thine inestimable love and the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we beseech thee, give us that due sense of all thy mercy, that our hearts may be unfailingly thankful, and that we show forth thy praise not only with our lips, but in our lives. By giving up ourselves to thy service and by walking before thee, in holiness and righteousness all our days through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with thee and the Holy Ghost be all honor and glory, world without end. Amen. Almighty God, who has given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplication unto thee, and has promised through thy well-beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, that will be in the midst of them. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions of thy servants as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of thy truth and in the world to come, life everlasting. Amen. Life is short, and we do not have much time to gladden the hearts of those who journey the way with us. So we swift to love and make haste to be kind, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and all those you love and remain with you this day and forevermore. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God.